Welcome back to the show, everyone. A consumer movement has begun gathering momentum, and it's pointed squarely at Ubisoft following the closure of the crew with implications for every game that needs a server to function. One YouTuber has taken as much as he can stomach from companies shuttering the servers of games, effectively deleting them from existence for the sake of cents on the dollar, and now, because of that, he is fighting back. But not alone, because it's up to us to stop killing games That is what we're going to be talking about today. Now, to kick things off, obviously, we've been talking about the problems of preservation for a long time on this channel. Things like PlayStation's kill switch that they have on consoles, Nintendo targeting emulators, Spec Ops The Lines delisting, which, I mean, absolutely sucks given how much of, uh, well, I, I suppose a narratively groundbreaking game that was, and then last year's bombshell reporting on the fact that 87% of games from the medium's history are simply unplayable, unavailable in any form, which was absolutely mind-boggling to me. Now, you then pair that with a report here from Newzu that more than 60% of gamers are playing the same games that they were six years ago, with the vast majority of those being paid to play live service titles. And I think you can see that this truly is a looming disaster. And uh, I guess if you're maybe wondering, like, why are a lot of modern games not doing particularly well? (sighs) Well, there's a a lot of older games that people mono game or just sort of have as their default game and have done for maybe a decade. It's very hard to have people actually move away from those games to the newer things. Going back to the story, though, when the servers switch off for these games, What that is, is a full purchase you made that you can no longer access. Never mind, of course, any digital currency, any items that you've bought during the lifespan of that title. This is probably where the Web3 bros come in and say, ah, but if you in fact owned a token for that skin, if that was on the chain, it would be yours forever. To which we then say, well, what's the point of that if the game, if the experience isn't actually there? So that essentially is the thing. In so many games, we buy these cosmetics and ultimately they'll disappear disappear. Right now, though, this is something that most of us don't feel. It's almost always happening in games that just have not found their feet commercially. But as we've seen in, say, games like Apex Legends, the second the line stops going up at the expected rate, management will start chopping things. They will start charging more to eke out more profit. And of course, you could then look back on the earnings, well, not just the earnings reports, but actually what executives at EA had said about the game in those earnings reports and see that, well, they're complaining about about the status of the line and how it's not going up high enough. And then in a, shortly after in an event, they've been more greedy. What happens when the line doesn't go up? Well, games get a bit more greedy. The things get ridiculous. But what happens to those games when the line has stopped going up? It started going down, it's dwindled away, and now all that you have is a few dedicated players and there just isn't a massive commercial reason to keep a game going. Now, we've actually seen good versions of what to do in this, specifically from an indie team at Velen Studios this year. They basically closed down Knockout City, right? But they did so in a way that handed the game over to players to play privately. And that is the gold standard here. Yes, you may turn off your own dedicated servers that you run, but there must be a way for the community to then pick up that torch. And I think ultimately on this, what we will want is a form of indie industry standardization, where there is just a process for doing this that is kind of what everybody does. That's really what I would want to advocate for. Now, of course, for the bigger companies, you know, who um, who just don't give a shit. They're not going to do what that team did with Knockout City. And that is where YouTuber Ross Scott, the man behind Accursed Farms, who you may know from the web show Freeman's Mind, he wants to help and actually hold these companies accountable. And this has made quite a lot of headlines. Now, the context here is that for years, he has been on the consumer advocacy train, and he's been doing this via his Dead Game News series, which essentially tackles issues of ownership, and really a framing that games as a service is fraud. Now, it's one of those things where maybe legally it may not be, but spiritually a lot of people could say that it is. Yes, you are technically buying a license to uh, play this video game, but insofar as most of our experiences go, you buy a game, it's a product, you expect to be able to access the product that you have bought. So the idea that online games can be shut down with no recourse for players is fundamentally spooky. Now, in December 2023, Ubisoft announced that The Crew 2014 would be shutting down its servers on April 1st, rendering the game unplayable. And they didn't lie. On April 1st, that happened 
On April 2nd, Scott was ready to go and he posted the video. He posted the video and then he set this website live, the Stop Killing Games movement. That certainly is a good way to frame it. It's emotive and it feels right because essentially this is games being killed. Now, what this is, is a global effort that is appealing to anyone who has purchased the crew. That's what it's doing in the first instance. And actually per Ubisoft's blog post, that is 12 million players. Yeah, 12 million before those servers were turned off. So initially it is very focused on that bit of news, but it is really extended to everybody who wants to be a part of a movement that he is trying to kick off to basically define and then protect protect consumer rights within games. Here's a quote. An increasing number of video games are sold as goods, but designed to be completely unplayable for everyone as soon as support ends. The legality of this practice is untested worldwide, and many governments do not have clear laws regarding these actions. It is our goal to have authorities examine this behavior and hopefully end it as it is an assault on both consumer rights and preservation of media. And it's one of those things I think you can delve into the details. We can have a discussion about things, but I mean, emotively, one could say spiritually, that does feel right. The idea that games that we feel like we own can just go away feels wrong. It's as simple as that. I have so many games for my old PS2, my old Xbox 360. Ultimately, I can put them in and play. Some of those in the 360, though, of course, I can't because online services are down. So you might be thinking then, well, this is all well and good. This all sounds fine, but what is this movement actually going to do? What are the real steps? Broadly, it's taking two forms. Number one, explicitly using the consumer complaints process for France's Directorate General for Competition Policy, Consumer Affairs, and Fraud Control, otherwise known as the DGCCRF. <laughs> So doing that and flagging that your consumer rights have been impacted by the planned obsolescence of Ubisoft, which is a French company, of course. Now, this is banking that strong and especially strong as compared to the United States, uh, French consumer protections basically could be the way to actually exert pressure here. And the idea is that putting pressure on governments to ensure that companies are required by law to maintain functionality for the products that they sell you or to allow users to uh, do so after official support ends. Basically, using the law to achieve that is the stated goal. And to actually make that goal possible to achieve, the site has got a step-by-step -step process to actually do that based on different regions, which I think is a very commendable piece of work. At the end of the day, it's fine to try to rally people and say, you should be concerned about that. But I think what matters is putting the effort to actually help people be able to do that, right? To make it actionable. Now, their aim is to get as much pressure as much movement on this issue as is possible. Um, again, depending on your region and how many the crew owners that the site can reach. Now, let's just take a look at the UK's one. That's uh, technically where we are in Northern Ireland. So the situation here is that if a petition receives 100,000 signatures from UK residents, it will have to be debated in Parliament. So basically, for, for us, it's going to be so do enough signatures, get it into Parliament. Of course, if you're in France, you might be able to do quite a bit more. Let's talk about this then. Number one, this is obviously extremely idealistic, right? You could say that it's idealistic and uh, not really feasible because this is this is going against the grain. It's going against commercial interests. And ultimately, this is the kind of thing that Scott actually does acknowledge. He says that due to a large legal gray area just around the fact that digital games are licenses rather than products. So he acknowledges that gray area. I think that's one where things are going to be challenging. I mean, in the US, like in particular, that stuff is codified law. It's going to be a lot harder to change because ultimately, well, you do buy a game license. Yeah, it might come in a disc and you might think that disc is yours, but actually being able to use the software on that disc, that's the license that they've sold you. And this is something that happened. I mean, that ship sailed 
a long ass time ago in games, and that does mean it's going to be extremely hard to get any form of movement there. Now, some people have pointed out that this could quite simply lead to publishers simply shuttering a developer to write off their assets and therefore end obligations. I think that would very, very much be a worst case here. I think that with the sorts of games that realistically get their servers shut down, it's probably not a humongously expensive thing to uh, to avert that by offering some sort of community uh, solution there. But anyway, the aim, though, is not to have games supported forever by companies in an unrealistic fashion, and it's obviously not to bankrupt studios. The aim here is to have legal clarification on the rights of consumers, and then, in the best case scenario, some good worldwide implications. Again, I'm just going to read from the site. So, if destroying a game you paid for became illegal in France, companies that patch the game would likely have to apply the same patch to the game worldwide. An analogy to how this process is how the AC CCC in Australia forced Valve to offer refunds in Steam. So Valve ended up offering them to people worldwide as a result. And it's funny because that really is an oft forgotten story. That is one of the things that put massive pressure in Valve that ended up with us getting a refund system that while it has flaws, broadly speaking, is extremely consumer friendly. And uh, I mean, as an example, as an indie dev, the other side of, uh, I suppose, our operation is, yes, that does mean people could go, you know, play some of your game and then refund it. And there is definitely something to talk about there for games that are intended to be a low cost, short experience, say sub two hours. What I think about though, is number one, we offer a demo so people can go and do the demo. But also, if somebody knows that the whole store is backed up by that strong refund policy, I think that means that consumers will feel protected. That means they're more likely to just try and buy a game, sort of content in the knowledge that if there are bugs, if there are problems, no matter what it is, they can get a refund. Ultimately, yeah, there may be more refunds in a developer's dashboard, but I think too, there will be more sales because fundamentally, it's pro-consumer and it makes customers actually feel safe, which is important. To get back to things though, essentially the plan is to leverage how things are in France to then change policy on a more global level. And that's why the Valve thing is a just a fairly strong analogy here, right? But ultimately, I do think about who has money, who has power, and I think it's going to be fairly likely that governments will be uh, siding with corporations on this kind of thing. The corporations can pay lobbyists, they can do a lot to exert control. I mean, even just take the story with loot boxes. So you probably will have remembered, mostly from last year and the year before, that the UK was looking into loot boxes, and unfortunately, they decided to let the industry self-regulate. But recently, we've had a report that's actually found out that the companies are, um, a large percentage of them, are actually failing the self-regulated guidelines that they themselves advocated for in lieu, of course, of something via the government that would actually have a degree of teeth. Now, I do understand that, you know, if you keep on stacking up, uh, you know, regulation and regulation and regulation, that, that obviously can be good because those regulations can protect customers. There is also sometimes a more negative side to that where a regulation can be a barrier to entering a market where, yes, it might be inconvenient for an incumbent player, but ultimately an incumbent will have the resources to get around that regulation, whereas a newer company won't have the resources to get around that regulation and therefore the regulation will make them less competitive. I think though that in this case, it's likely not a massive issue. And if this sort of thing was to become the norm, I think you would see like multiplayer, uh, you know, software, right? Like, you know, just different toolkits. You'd probably see them support something to allow a developer to actually sunset their game. And that would be a nice point of differentiation and marketing for a multiplayer, uh, you know, developer suite to um, to actually do. So yes, this won't be fast. And ultimately the governments may just side with the corporations under current laws, especially in regards to how we actually are buying a license, but not a game. But I think what this does do is it bands consumers together, right? And it helps us get clarity. It gives us a target to aim for, and it basically just helps with collective action. And that essentially is the point. That's what Scott has stated in the video. And I'm just going to read from, uh, well, a transcript. If we pass the petitions, governments have to respond and own that answer. If consumer agencies get enough complaints, they probably will too. We won't have any more of this 
no clear regulation crap. I can promise you that much. Plus, if we win, you can imagine how good it will feel in the future knowing all your games are safe and you only have to think about whether you like the game or not. And that ultimately is something that I very much agree with. I feel that that is right. And even if there is not a humongously high chance of, um, you know, cr creating some sort of massive new, uh, you know, law or, or change in how this is handled. I think even just getting consumers to be aware that this is a problem, I, I just think that that is good. Because you see, the, the normalization of things that aren't good, uh, th that's a problem. And sorry, I know I'm kind of, I'm, I'm just ad living here, but I think that this is fundamentally the larger problem here. And the analogy is obviously that, uh, you know, the, the frog in the pot of water, who knows if that's actually how it works with a frog. I'm not really in the habit of boiling frogs personally, but I look at what you see coming out of the younger generations. Now, I am not trying to make this some sort of generation versus generation crap. What I am saying though, is what we are used to, what our normal is, that completely changes how we see the rest of the world. A lot of people growing up today, they have only known microtransactions. They have only known Roblox and Fortnite. That, that's what they know. To them, the idea that a game is not some, you know, service thing that you log into with a bunch of currencies in it, that, that is actually abnormal. To, to them, Portal is a boomer game. <laughs> you know, Uncharted 2, Uncharted 3, boomer games. That's actually how it is. And I just have to say, think about all of your foundational memories. For me, that is World of Warcraft. For me, that is Age of Empires 2. For a lot of people coming up and enjoying our medium right now, it's Destiny, it's uh, FIFA with Ultimate Team. It's stuff that is fundamentally different. Now, we remember, we know what owning a game is like. Properly owning a game, having it physically. They don't know that. And that's why I think awareness campaigns like this are extremely extremely important. That's essentially it for today's video. I think that this is a pretty cool campaign. I absolutely, I want to signal boost it, give you my thoughts, and I suppose help get the word out there because this is a real problem. And I would just say, think not of today, think not of 10 years, think of 20 years. Maybe think in thir of 30 years. Maybe, you know, you, you have kids, there's some old games you used to play and they're just completely inaccessible in any way and how much that would kind of suck. You know, my parents would be able to show me a movie from their day. <laughs> what if the game you want to show your kids just uh, just is off? That sucks. It's not a problem we're facing right now, but it is one we'll face in the future. And I think we should think about the future because if we don't try to shape the future, do you know who will? The, the, the corporations just stand to gain and that won't be in our best interests. So GG, check out the site and I'll see you back here tomorrow.